So I've had to sort of limit and so it's sort of a bit of a, a bit of a mix match, but um, I'm trying to cover some of the most common and interesting things that we see, including mucoseals and um, bile duct obstructions in particular. So some of them are some of the most interesting cases, sometimes the most critical and challenging and sometimes the highest mortality with regard to getting them stable and getting them into surgery. So, so the thing about um, biliary disease is the, the clinical signs are not terribly specific. So they're, they're coming up on the screen there. So, you know, abdominal pain, you know, could be biliary, could be, could be GI, could be pancreatitis. Um, a lot of the signs are really non-specific there. Um, and much the same as cats, you know, lethargy, vomiting, and appetence is well, pretty much um, the clinical signs of every single disease they get. So, so biliary disease, you know, you, you might be able to localise it to the cranial abdomen on physical exam. You know, when, once you're trying to establish primary or secondary Gastrointestinal disease is a cause of any vomiting or abdominal pain or acute abdomen. Obviously, your biochem screen is one of the first things that you do. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to speak up or, um, or type in the messages and we'll, I'll try and address them as we go along. So, so there's a pretty, um, pretty common pattern of um, blood findings we see with these. The, the hepatocellular enzymes will come up. They may already have concurrent chronic hepatitis conditions, depending on the breed as well. But as you know, if it's sort of getting into the biliary tract and gallbladder, you'll particularly get changes in the GGT and the ALP. So there'll be a much more <coughs> um, generous increase in the ALP in particular. And once we, once we get to the level of cholestasis, be it intrahepatic or extrahepatic, and you'll, you'll get icterus and hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, which may not become clinically apparent until it's well above 30 or 40 uh, examining the patient. But that's certainly a, a time to get concerned that you've got a degree of cholestasis or bile duct obstruction. We'll cover uh, extrahepatic bile duct obstructions um, in due course. But I guess you've got to remember if the, if the extrahepatic bile ducts are occluded, then you've almost certainly got occlusion of the intrahepatic bile ducts as well. So you've got a degree of intrahepatic cholestasis as well. So there's certain um, signs you'll see on, on imaging, which will, you know, looking for pancreatitis, for example, which will point you towards an extrahepatic cause of jaundice, but you've often got both hepatic and post-hepatic causes of, of icterus occurring. A lot of these diseases will be inflammatory and uh, they'll have a neutrophilia, maybe even a pyrexia. And um, just for anyone who's entered late, then um, I'd just like to mention that this, this session is being recorded. So, so I'll try and keep my language clean throughout. Um, so, so a lot of these cases will have a neutrophilia and will be pyrexic, but not all. I mean, it's, um, it's quite disappointing when you've got a raging infection and no neutrophilia or pyrexia, but unfortunately it does happen. And it's, a, it's a, I think the golden rule with medicine is that you can just never say never. So always keep it on your radar if you're getting this pattern of um, particularly cholestatic enzymes and high bilirubin and neutrophil. You might even have a positive snap, so there may be pancreatic involvement, um, which may be the sole problem. You might just have a pancreatitis and bile duct obstruction, or it might just be an innocent bystander. So there's a lot of inflammatory mediators or ischemic or you know, poor blood flow in the area that might be enough to trigger a you know pretty high snap or, or spec cpl so as i said the cranial abdomen's got a whole um, conundrum of causes of diseases which can pre present present very similarly be it gastrointestinal obstruction pancreatitis any cause of hepatitis be it drugs or toxins or infections cholangitis, cholangiohepatitis, which occurs in dogs, probably not to the extent that it does in cats, but it does happen and can present similarly to, to gallbladder disease, such as um, or a mucosil, colorless, neoplasia, or bile duct obstruction, or even just inflammation or infection. So the cholangitis complex is you know, the most common cause of hepatobiliary disease in cats for sure. Nowhere near as common in dogs, but it certainly does happen. 
So the, um, Kathleen's kindly given me a few of her slides on gallbladder imaging. So I guess I have a particular interest in hepatic versus post-hepatic jaundice because it's uh, where imaging comes into its own. And um, so knowing how to locate the normal gallbladder and the abnormal gallbladder is crucially important. So the gallbladder is usually to the right. It's usually quite anechoic or black fluid in there. There's often a lot of sludge in dogs, particularly older dogs, and that's often completely incidental or non-clinical. It's more looking at the gallbladder wall and how thick and irregular that is, that is of interest in, in a sick dog, for example. There used to be a thought that any kind of sludge which comes up white is pathological in a cat, but I think that's sort of gone out of the window and look, jump forward a little bit. Um, so it, we certainly can see cats that are perfectly normal and perfectly healthy and yet have a little bit of white sludge. The wall thickness is pretty important, can be up to two millimetres in dogs and one in cats. Um, distal acoustic enhancement, I'm not sure if, if many of you are using ultrasound, but if the ultrasound waves travel through tissue, it's a lot um, slower and a lot more obstructed than it is through fluid. So if you've got, a say, a fluid structure, all the sound waves will travel through the normal gallbladder really quick and everything will look really bright ventral to that. And that's what we call acoustic enhancement. Looking at the bile duct is really important. It can be very difficult. Um, in normal patients, particularly dogs, it can be hard to identify at all. And you can get a little bit of distension with cholestasis, but it can go up to four millimetres in dogs and actually five millimetres in cats. Uh, cats classically get quite a tortuous bile duct because it's a little, little wormy structure which can kind of um, be quite impressively tortuous in some scans. But they can be um, pretty important to identify them and ideally the source of the obstruction too, to identify extra hepatic bile duct obstruction. So just having a little look at the anatomy there. So you've got the gallbladder, as I said, right to the, um, the right of the midline, heading down into the cystic duct. The, the ducts join from the other liver lobes and then they join the common bile duct, which um, you know, in the dog, it's separated from the pancreatic duct at the duodenal papilla, whereas in the cats, they join before entering, entering the duodenum which is pretty crucial in some of the pathophysiology of some of their disease, in particular the degree of bacterial reflux in cats. So there's a more schematic diagram there um, to show exactly where the bile is produced, going in, you know, from the hepatocytes into the canaliculi, the bile ductules, the intra, then interlobular ducts, hepatic ducts, and then joining the cystic duct and causing the common bile duct. Um, so there's some pictures of um, pretty normal gallbladders there. So normal gallbladder in a dog, pretty normal sludge. You can see that, can everyone see my mouse cursor? Jeff, can you see that? Yeah, so that's the acoustic enhancement I was talking about. You've got the sound waves uh, travelling through with greater speed and um, number through the liquid and then forming this bright uh, layer here. But this sludge here is pretty normal finding in an older dog. I'd say most dogs you scan over 10 have got some degree of sludge in there. This is a, I'm going to play this little video here. This is a bilobed, bilobed gallbladder in a cat. Uh, I think that's present in up to 30% of cats, so um, it looks kind of funky, but that's, um, that's pretty normal or within normal limits. So um, there's a number of changes you can see in the, in the gallbladder, and um, you can certainly see edema quite commonly. You can get it from trauma or anaphylaxis as well. You can get it from other causes of edema, such as right-sided heart failure, hypoproteinemia as well. And you can see that this is a classic case of anaphylaxis. You will see some bee sting cases that will come in like that. There's one on the right there that's a um, pretty nice layer of edema there. And you sort of get a similar appearing wall in cholecystitis where the wall looks kind of thickened. But with cholecystitis, and I guess it can be a bit subjective, but it can be um, quite kind of bright and irregular as well. There's some other pretty cool findings you can see in gallbladders. If you get some anaerobic organisms, you can get um, gas forming within the gallbladder. Indeed, you can get that in the liver as well. And emphysema is hepatitis can have you know, liver in the gas shadow. Here you can see um, 
on the ultrasound image, you can see this sort of dirty, dirty looking gas bubbles there in the bladder. So you may well have a, a clostridia or bacteroides or another organism like that causing the, the gas production. You can see, you've got to be on this radiograph, you can see that stomach gas there, but you can see within the paddock parenchyma or where the, at the level of the gallbladder, you've got some gas. So um, that can be a real giveaway too. So this is very naughty to have only one view of a radiograph. You should also always have orthogonal views. Isn't that right, Jeff? Um, but if you can sort of locate the so, yeah. gallbladder on the lateral and then also on your VD, then um, you'll find the gas sort of sitting where that's not consistent with GI gas and is sort of within the well, what should be liver shadow. So it'll make sense. Let me sing out if you've got any questions. Um, I've got Flynn's nice and put some arrows on the radiograph for us there too. Can everyone see that? I'll, um, I will share the slides later so you can check it out at your, at your leisure. Um, the gas is probably more obvious on this VD here. You see on that right side of the midline, you've got a little bit of gas there. Um, I'm not seeing it that well myself here, but I think that's um, that's about there within the liver. No, sorry, here it is. Um, so well within where the where the liver shadow should be, and probably more apparent on that VD. Um, so collar lists can be pretty interesting. Not always clinical. Um, they only really cause a problem, particularly in dogs, if they cause obstruction or if they cause infection. Whereas a lot of time they're incidental findings and just picked up on routine imaging or imaging for another problem. So um, there's a there's a cat we saw at, at NVS with a with a nice collar lift there. And sort of like a urinary bladder stone there, you can see the really bright margin there and then the, the acoustic shadowing behind the, the collar lift. So, so that's a quite a massive stone in a, in a gallbladder and a cat, which is not too common, but, but a, yeah, pretty good image there. So they're usually composed of calcium, cholesterol and bilirubin. So um, probably more likely to be radio-opaque in a dog and cat than a human. So yeah, well worth a radiograph to have a look around. So a collodocolith there on the right there, then they can also have these stones occurring within the intrahepatic bile ducts. And um, you can see these bright shadowing objects within the bile ducts, within the liver. So they're collodocoliths. With this one, there's no evidence of bile duct obstruction around there. So, um, so I don't think, I think they're just minding their own business, but they can cause some degree of um, obstruction and infection too. But often in my experience, they're discovered as an incidental finding, sometimes with a, a in conjunction with a collarlith, but sometimes by themselves. Um, so you can see, oh, this is quite, it looks, sort of my cat's upset um so there's see this sort of these hyper hyper uh, radio opaque um markings within the bile ducts here so they're within the bile ducts of the, the liver there so that's colored docker lists on on radiographs so a big um collar list on an ultrasound of a bladder you can see that complete shadow much like you would see for a urinary bladder stone. So, extrahepatic bile duct obstruction. So, if, you, if you've got an ictric patient and you've worked out they're not prehepatic, so there's no, no hemolysis, then um, the next step is to work out whether they're hepatic or post-hepatic. You might get a bit of a feel from that from the bloods. Like if the ALT is 10,000 and the ALP is rarely budged, it, it may well be a primary liver disorder. However, if the ALT is up and the ALP is up too or a bit more um, elevated than the hepatocellular enzymes, then imaging is the next place to go. Pancreatitis is by far the most common cause, in certainly in dogs, probably in cats as well. Um, but also we might find other things such as we've discussed as collarless or mucosils. Neoplasia is quite rare and um, but can occasionally be found and sometimes just stuck to the to the neck of the gallbladder. Um, the 
bile duct dilation is a lot more diagnostic of extrahepatic bile duct obstruction. You would think logically that you would see a distended gallbladder, but it's not always the case. So um, whilst it may have been distended at some point, you, um, it may come down in size and you'll just be left with bile duct obstruction. So, so looking for bile ducts greater than four millimetres in a dog or five in a cat, and particularly if you can find a, a stone or a tumour or a pancreatitis causing it, is diagnostic of, or is diagnostic of extrahepatic um, biliary obstruction. As I said before, cat's bile ducts can be quite torturous, so you can get quite a funky kind of mess of tubes or too many tubes in, in the liver in a cat. It's also worth putting the colour on to distinguish between whether you're looking at a bile duct or a blood vessel. Blood vessels will obviously light up like a Christmas tree with the colour Doppler on, but um, the bile ducts won't and also the bile ducts usually have a bright or hyperechoic lining within. So this is what, um, what I mean by a cat with a tortuous distended bile duct there. So this cat's got collarless and has got quite distended bile ducts. And this is quite a classic, um, quite common finding in dogs with nasty pancreatitis and bile duct obstruction. So I was playing the video there, this hypoechoic, so that's a bit of duodenum there. And this is um, a bit of hypoechoic pancreas here. And just on the kind of bottom left is the, is the distended bile duct coming into it there. So you'll sort of see, sorry, I can't get that on the loop, but you'll sort of see a distended bile duct and then um, going into the gallbladder. Can everyone see what's going on there? One more time. So quite a classic and common finding. So um, bile duct obstructions. So this, there was a paper from I think 10 years back of 200 dogs from, from the US. So. Uh, look, nearly half of them are caused by pancreatitis and then smaller percentages of mucosils and colourless and cancers. Uh, trauma, pretty uncommon. I don't know what the numbers are, but way less common than you think. I think I've seen one or two in, um, in 10 years or so. Um, cholecystitis can certainly, call, uh, conjunction with cholangitis, cause a combination of intra and extrahepatic bile duct obstruction. Ultrasonographic features. Um, these studies were done on poor experimental beagles many years ago where they ligated their bile ducts and saw what happened. I don't think they get ethics approval anymore. But the, the gallbladder went up, followed by a cystic duct, and then within two days, the common bile duct, then extrahepatic, intrahepatic bile ducts. So, so there's sort of a, a well-known sequence of things that, um, that happens once you've got occlusion of the bile duct. Um, so certainly on imaging, but also um, on, on biochem as well. Uh, and also you'll probably get, by that week's times, you'll get a lack of fat soluble vitamins. So vitamin K deficiency is an important problem too, which is why we often need to supplement with vitamin K, both if the liver's failing, but certainly if the bile duct is obstructed for a period of time, because they won't be able to activate their clotting factors. So here's a distended bile duct here, um, secondary to extrahepatic bile duct obstruction, um, both in cross section and longitudinal section of the same case. This is probably the video that we saw that had the, had the pancreatitis in here. So, um, so you get accumulation of toxic bile, bile acids and also damage to the liver itself. So even though you didn't end up with a primary liver disorder, you'll get secondary damage, secondary to the bile duct obstruction. And if things are around for long enough and you don't relieve the obstruction, you'll actually get liver failure and reduction of liver enzyme levels due to, well, hepatic cirrhosis and decreased functional hepatic mass. So, so don't be fooled by an improvement in your liver enzymes. That can be a really bad sign. So, so good time to get into imaging first and eventually there'll be portal hypertension developing and some of these embryonic portosystemic shunts will break up. So you may well develop encephalopathy. Coagulopathies in a number of cases, you know, up to 20% in some studies. 
um, not always with um, obvious uh, in-house clotting time testings are quite crude and so the numbers are quite low but even if PT and APTT are elevated in only 10%, I think a lot more have a coagulopathy. So I would give vitamin K routinely, particularly if you're using anything sharp. You've also got to remember that protein C and protein S are in there. So some of the thrombotic um, factors there, so they can be hypercoagulable. So you can have quite an array of bleeding and um, thrombotic disorders with liver failure or bile duct obstruction. Um, so it's a good idea to give vitamin K, look at your clotting factors. If things are really bad, you might want to give some plasma if you're going to do surgery or biopsies. And a buccal mucosal bleeding time might be a good idea because it, it affects quite a, um, a few other factors that are stabilising the fibrin clot too. Um, so I... I think the if, I don't I don't think there's a clear cut recommendation even to this day about when to when to get the surgeons in. But I guess if um, things are progressive after a week or two, a surgeon will say definitely get in there and investigate the bile duct. In reality, if you've got something reverse as reversible as pancreatitis, you can potentially medically manage bile duct obstructions for a few weeks. Um, however, depending on the status of the dog and the finances of the owner and the state of the patient, then it might be not a good idea to get the surgeons in there to flush things and perhaps put a stent in there after a week or two if, you, if your bilirubin's the wrong side of 100 or 200. However, it's not to be entered lightly. There can be a number of complications such as endotoxemia, hemorrhage, wound breakdown, can make the pancreatitis worse, although that's sort of been debunked a little bit, um, but it's always been a traditional fear of not wanting to go into these cases for, for fear of making the pancreatitis work. There are a number of um, tubes that can be put in. I think laparoscopically, it's a very high skill level to do that. Uh, even the percutaneous endoscopic technique takes a lot of skill and I think even some of the experienced um, endoscopic clinicians in the US still get the human and uh, GI gastroenterologists in to help them. So it's pretty difficult. And you've sort of got to point backwards with the scope to get back up the bile duct. So unfortunately, we're looking at open x laps or um, at least um, laparoscopic surgery, if available, to, to try and um, temporarily help the bile duct obstruction. So you can use short-term stenting and uh, the biliary anastomoses are probably a last, time, last, a last resort. If you've got a tumour more than anything, they can also be hideously infected and have reflux problems. And it also is, um, it's, a, it's probably your last resort and you've permanently lost your gallbladder, your bile storage mechanism. If you, so the cholecystic duodenostomy is basically suturing the gallbladder to the the duodenum or jejunum, I think they use more commonly. And so it can, can certainly save lives in the short term, but is not without complications in the long term. So one of my, um, my favourite gallbladder topics is, or cases are mucosal cases. So you've got the, a typical kiwi fruit pattern there or the stellate pattern there. This is all gallbladder wall here or cystic mucinous hyperplasia. The gallbladder is quite a cool organism and well as the urinary bladder we, we just think of them as storage sacs but they're actually quite metabolically active they can absorb fluids they can secrete enzymes um, but they also need to be protected from the you know, pretty potent bile bile acids and bile salts so if those mechanisms are disrupted you can have a hell of a lot of reaction and mucinous hyperplasia to the gallbladder wall and they used to think there was a mutation in, um, in this in some shelties um, that led to predispose them to injury of the gallbladder wall and um, production of these mucosils and, and equally there's a lot of disorders, a lot of them endocrine, that are disruptions in lipid metabolism, which make the make the gallbladder prone to injury, such as Cushing's is a very common cause of gallbladder mucosal, exogenous steroids, supposedly hypothyroidism as well. Um, so progressive accumulation of tenacious mucin-laden bile 
Um, they're quite solid and disgusting when you get them out. They can extend into the rest of the cystic, hepatic and bile ducts and cause bile duct obstruction. So, so it's not just this lump of fleshy bile that's within the gallbladder, it's going to be right through the bile ducts. And so, so you can get, um, get recurrent problems with these dogs even after they've had a cholecystectomy. The critical problem with these mucus seals is that they can expand and um, they dehydrate and expand with time and they can actually put more and more pressure on the gallbladder wall as an ischemic necrosis and eventually rupture of the gallbladder and um, bile peritonitis. Infection, the studies vary a lot, but some of the earlier studies were saying eight to 10% of them were infected, but a recent study is showing more, more more like up to 28%. And obviously if you've got filthy infected bile leaking all through the abdomen, you're gonna set up potentially fatal um, peritonitis. IBD is quite prevalent, not necessarily causative, but they have found a much higher prevalence of IBD in dogs with mucus seals. So <clears throat> like um, any gallbladder disease, it's the same Constellation of signs, vomiting, inappetence, lethargy, PUPD, often because of the underlying disease or by unknown mechanisms. They can have varying degree of gastrointestinal upsets and can even present with bile peritonitis and you know, be critical cases. So lab findings, you'll see typical of any kind of infected gallbladder disorder. They really need an ultrasound to diagnose. So the risk factors including breed and that mutation I mentioned. Um, they're usually older dogs, often with endocrinopathies. A lot of, I don't know, I don't know what the figures are on how many hyper dogs get them, but, um, but um, I guess anecdotally I'd say at least 50 or 60% will go on to develop them, particularly breeds such as miniature schnauzers. Pancreatitis is a risk factor. They're thinking more and more gallbladder dysmotility has got a, a huge thing to do with it. And you've got to remember that the gallbladder motility is controlled by the duodenum and the release of cholecystokinin, which literally means move the gallbladder. And so any disruption in the cholecystokinin or the small intestine is going to affect the motility of the gallbladder and maybe predispose them to build up these feral mucosils. So, so Disorders of lipid metabolism, perhaps even dietary disorders that are high fat, protein losing nephropathies, neoplasia, um, high lipids such as in miniature schnauzers are familial forms. And glucocorticoid treatment, I've seen mucosils progress very rapidly in dogs treated with glucocorticoids, so you've got to be very careful. And if you've already diagnosed a mucosil and you've got a condition that requires steroids, you've got to be really careful about what's happening in the gallbladder. And I guess a good way to get around future problems would be to, to do a preemptive cholecystectomy. So Kathleen's kindly provided some more videos of mucosils. So I'll just play them for you now. And so you can see that classic stellate pattern happening, particularly on that right one. Um, and it's really important how, mo how much of it's mobile or not. So the one on the right in particular looks like it's 100% solid. So kind of getting different angles on the ultrasound, shaking it about a little bit, then you can kind of determine whether that's completely solid, which is much more of an indication for surgery as opposed to one that's not quite as mature, which um, might sit down there for a year or two before before causing major problems. So um, the flip side is some of them might just sit there and not do a great deal. So this is a, a case that was being monitored for hypercalcemia and you can see in July last year, this looked like it really needed to come out. And in fact, I would have recommended um, cholecystectomy at that time before it developed a, a bile peritonitis and um, potentially you know, critical illness or death, whereas this case tend to resolve and actually improve with time. And there's a paper I'll mention later on um, looking at medical therapy versus surgical therapy. And as long as they don't you know, develop critical bile peritonitis or, um, and survive the 
two weeks after diagnosis, including whether they have surgery or not, they actually can, can last for a few years on medical therapy, such as denamarin and ursifolk, plus or minus antibiotics too. So mucus seals, they like to call a kiwi fruit pattern. So that I just had a slice of kiwi fruit handy. I just show everyone. Um, and this is what they look like post-surgery. So the gallbladder walls um, abnormal, and you can see this um, kind of solid mucinous bile in there. And um, so it's pretty better out than in, really. So this is a, the paper I mentioned before. The um, it's just on JVIM, which is open access, so you can check the reference there. And it's pretty, pretty important there, but I guess the take home messages there are that the long term survival can be pretty similar. The perioperative mortality is pretty high, up to 40 40%. But of those that did survive that period, the, the dogs with surgery did better, you know, maybe almost six years, whereas. Um, the medical group did okay, but um, but not quite as good. I think that the bi major bias in this case is that dogs that were extremely severe cases needing surgery would have been um, weeded out of that medical group. So I think by its nature, they would have been the, the milder forms. However, it, it is an expensive surgery, so it is worth a try if surgery is not an option. So there's sort of a grading picture of um, mucosils. We've been, we get sent a few quite early ones and there's a lot of crossover between what's sludge and what's, what's developing a mucosil, but it's important to look at how, how mobile it is, whether it's causing a pattern of solid material within the gallbladder. And um, if the more kind of abnormal looking gallbladder wall and the more solid and kiwi-like pattern you've got, the more severe you are. Um, and if they do rupture, there's a study I think I've got in here, it wasn't actually associated with a worse outcome because those were probably rushed to surgery and, and did okay. And, as, and the incidence of infection doesn't seem to be as bad as was once thought. So gallbladder ruptures, uh, they can be quite subtle. You do need an experienced ultrasonographer to pick these up, but you need to probably look at the gallbladder from all angles. Have, have a look at this little, um, the surface that between the gallbladder and liver here on this video. You can see a bit of kind of swirling liquid sort of in here between the gallbladder and the liver there. And you can see just this bit of gallbladder it doesn't look continuous. And um, you have got some acoustic enhancement there, which making it bright, but you also may have some inflammation surrounding fat. So, so it's probably a tough call on the subtle ones. Some of them are more obvious and sometimes you've got a, a big gallbladder and then you don't. So um, that's, that's obviously a good, a bad sign and a, a good indication for surgery. Uh, there's a still image here where you can quite nicely see that um, fluid surrounding the gallbladder and some pretty bright fat around there. So this guy, um, this guy needed surgery as well. So, um, so any questions about um, mucosils? Feel free to, to shoot me a question later. My um, email address has come up on a couple of these slides too, uh, or you can just message me to contact you later or. Uh, have a look at the references. So cholangitis, um, I don't want to make a big deal of this, but uh, and it's not a huge thing in dogs, and the incidence is probably 10% of that of hepatitis, but there is a, certainly a, a number of dogs that are affected by inflammation or infection of the bile ducts, um, and they can also get infections in, in the gallbladder. Presence of bacteria in the Gallbladder is still, I think, meant to be pathological in humans, but it's still debatable in dogs and cats. And I think there's been a few demonstrating asymptomatic bacteriolia, but um, and I, I guess in the absence of any other clinical signs in blood changes, then um, you can probably just keep an eye on things. But, um, but in general, blood up there, either from reflux from the small intestine or hematogenous um, needs to be closely monitored. So there, there's been a few studies, some coming out um, in the last 10 years or so. So it's important if these guys do have samples or surgery to, well, aspirate the bile to culture. And if they are going to surgery, then you want to 
culture of the bile and the gallbladder wall. So fresh tissue cultures are pretty important. So the gallbladder wall and also biopsying the liver, like in the adjacent lobes is pretty important. But as they can be quite different pathology in different liver lobes, it's also important to, to biopsy other lobes of the liver as well to, so you can have a full understanding of what's happening in your patient. Um, as you can see here, the incidence of positive cultures are much higher from bile than from liver, liver tissue. But I have had the odd case that's been positive on tissue culture and negative on bile. Uh, a lot of these studies are confounded by patients having antibiotics preoperatively, uh, which is often quite necessary and important for some of these patients. But, um, but the take home message is if they are going to surgery, then get some liver and get some bile and see, see what you can come up with. So um, usually older animals, again, the same syndrome of signs with any kind of pancreatitis or gallbladder disease, vomiting, icterus, probably abdominal pain, inappetence, lethargy, marked liver enzyme elevation, ALP and bilirubin, often inflammatory leukogram. You may see some changes on ultrasound of the gallbladder wall. So in a sick dog with no other explanation, if they've got bright irregular gallbladder walls and changes in the liver parenchyma, then you, know, you may have uh, cholangitis and cholecystitis going on, so that may well be an indication for a bile aspirate and or liver cultures in surgery, depending on how severe the case is. So it's also one of those things that you know, you're welcome to refer, obviously, but if, you, if you're questioning, questioning the significance of your findings or indication for surgery, then you know, we're more than happy to, to have a chat and um, help you out. So, Positive cultures, as I said, bile's more, more sensitive. Um, I haven't really adjusted this time recommendation of antimicrobials since everyone started getting all funny about long courses of antibiotics, but, um, but it is pretty severe disease with pretty serious liver or tissue penetration. So I think at least a four week, four week culture is pretty reasonable and ideally you want a culture negative post um, Post procedure and cholecystectomy, and ideally want resolution of pyrexia and neutrophilia and a massive improvement in liver enzymes before before stopping. Um, the bacterial cholangitis, cholangitis, depending on the underlying cause, often do have a good prognosis. However, uh, there's a paper here from a few years ago that um, Talking about cholangitis and cholecystitis, um, so it's a, a UK study of 27 dogs. Uh, there's another more recent study of 54 cases, but um, I think this one, yeah, the, the common finding in these studies is some of the bacteria, they're often enterococcus or E. coli, and there is a high degree of resistance. So E. coli, enterococcus, clostridia, and other anaerobes are the most common. Uh, so important to do those cultures, as we've mentioned. I've got a chart of antibiotics um, here. My common, common antimicrobial regimen is clabulox and enrofloxacin if they're able to tolerate medications. Intravenously, we've been using Piptaz or Piperacillin if, um, if they're critical and can't take oral medications. So these papers are all in JVIM and, um, and open access, so, so feel free to check them out at your leisure. So I've got a couple of little cases to kind of close, towards closing out with. A uh, 13 year old female spay Chihuahua cross with a, was pyrexic with abdominal pain cracking elevation in ALP and decent bilirubin elevation, hepatocellular enzymes are also elevated, cholesterol certainly goes up a lot with cholestasis, it also goes up with endocrine disorders, but if you've got that pattern of all the bilirubin um, elevation, then it's pretty sure you've got an extra hepatic disorder, that's not to say that um, imaging is crucially important. Uh, neutrophilia, the, the lipase was up, the um, clotting times are elevated too, so that's annoying. But um, I think this is in the days before we had any kind of um, potentiated um, penicillin 
to use intravenously and ampicillin are sort of, well, I think we developed, we found we had 30% resistance um, at, uh, at one facility. So I've sort of, it's gone out of favor a little bit for kind of for padded biliary organs, or organisms. So it's so either oral clavulox if they can take it or IV piptas are our drugs of choice. I gave vitamin K, I probably, if we'd needed to do surgery here, I probably would have done a plasma transfusion as well. So this is the dog's gallbladder, as you can see, very thick and bright, irregular gallbladder wall. Um, despite me banging on about taking cultures, there's no way I'd go near this gallbladder with a, with a needle. It just looks so dirty. But with that liver enzyme picture and the cholestasis and this appearance of the gallbladder, I'm, pretty confident that's diseased and um, and needs aggressive therapy. So we did an X lab, flushed the bile duct, did a cholecystectomy. Um, the liver enzymes improved significantly. Uh, histopath has showed well, disease in all, all areas. So chronic, ac chronic active cholecystitis and cholangiohepatitis. So this, the whole liver and biliary system was just a petri dish. They found clostridia, so um, probably the moxiclavir alone would have been enough for this case. But um, that dog actually did quite well despite having such a diseased gallbladder. And thankfully, there was also a recent publication showing with diseased gallbladders, they do a hell of a lot better doing surgery on them you know, before they get sick, which is sort of intuitive. Whereas if you wait until they're really sick, the risk of surgery and the morbidity and mortality is so much greater. So I think if you've got a bad disease, gallbladder and, or colorless or um, bile duct obstruction, then if you can try and stabilize them clinically with fluids and antibiotics before getting into surgery, or if you've got a, a gallbladder mucosal and a healthy dog, then getting into theater before waiting for them to, to get sick would be recommended. So as I said, this was in the days before we had any, well, we probably had um, ticocillin, but it's sort of um, unavailable now and probably a bit too heavy duty for to be used in animals um, conscionably. So a so reasonable um, schedule in these cases would be clavulox and enro if taken oral or piptaz and enro. The addition of metronidazole is recommended in some. There's a few bacteroides, for example, that are, that are resistant to um, metronidazole. Um, so that table will be available in the notes afterwards, but it's um, just taken from the textbooks and, and altered slightly. So, so gram-positive gram negatives and anaerobes need to, need to be covered pretty readily. Supportive medications, vitamin K, as I mentioned, vitamin E is an antioxidant. It's pretty hard to, to find a decent formulation. and I haven't seen one recently, but if you can get hold of it, it's supposed to be helpful. Versidioxycholic acid, there's not a lot of evidence that it does a great deal, but it, um, it's anti-inflammatory and choleratic and sort of immunomodulatory in its own right. So it's commonly used in a lot of these biliary cases. This was also in the days before denimarin, but the denimarin is a combination of the SAMI and the milk thistle, the silibinin. So the combination product is used for, well, as anti-inflammatory helping the metabolism and uh, antioxidant in the liver as well so when they talk about medical therapy of mucosils for example they're talking about denimar and acidioxycholic acid and then antibiotics as necessary so long-term hepatoprotectants and then at least a month of antibiotics and and then probably redoing bloods and clinical assessment you either might need to continue antibiotics or, or stop them periodically uh, there's another case of a, a 10 year old female spa. Any questions, feel, feel free to put something up on the chat and I can stop and go back. So, a uh, 10 year old female spade, Kelpie Cross, one month history of weight loss in an appetence, huge elevation in liver enzymes, um, icterus, bilirubin through the roof. Uh, like all our cases, seem to have an abnormal CPL, treated with IV fluids, it must have been on oral meds and getting clavulox with its enro and metronidazole. Distended gallbladder and bile ducts and cholecystitis and a thickened pancreas. So it's probably hard to work out what's the chicken or the egg here. Is it pancreatitis leading to bile stasis and cholecystitis? 
um, four days later improved on that treatment regime. But you can see here that the, the gallbladder is quite kind of thickened and irregular. So I'm not too worried. For some reason, I've measured the gallbladder size here, but I'm probably more concerned about the thickness and kind of hyperechoic appearance of the gallbladder, which I haven't got the measurement on there, but it should only be two millimetres and it might be two or two and a bit in that, in that picture. However, we do have a distended gall bile duct here. Uh, can't see the measurement on there, but if that's, if that's more than four millimetres, we're probably talking about a, an, an obstruction there. And indeed, this case did have a nasty pancreatitis with um, any of you. Sorry, Jane, I'll get back to you in a sec. Um, so you can, any of you who are familiar with pancreatitis and ultrasound will know that the pancreas can be quite difficult to image, but this is kind of a classic acute pancreatitis appearance where it's sort of thickened, irregular, hypoechoic, and with this really bright fat around it. And that previous image would have been sort of leading into this is the area we're looking at on the next slide, the pancreatitis. So this is a demonstration of an extra hepatic bile duct obstruction leading into this mess of pancreas. Um, yeah, Jane asked a question about the evidence for N-acetylcysteine. That's a very good question. In an acute critically ill case that's too, too sick to accept an oral Denimarin or SAMI that as a thiol donor and helping liver metabolism, the N acetylcysteine is a very good alternative. So, if the, particularly if there's critical illness and no ability to take oral medication and pending liver failure, then the NAC would be a good option. And I think it's sort of a reasonable price these days compared to what it has been in the past. So, yeah, good point, Jane. Um, so the bile was aspirated with, with extended bile ducts. The ab abnormal liver was biopsy two. A few days later, the bilirubin dropped. Um, the papilla were flushed to clear out the bile ducts. The dog was discharged on antibiotics and mercifolk. There was E. coli culture from both the tissue culture and the bile. Um, and as a lot of these studies have also showed, there's a high degree of resistance to the um, enrofloxacin. So um, the fluoroquinolones may, may not play a use, useful role, but that's sort of the nature of um, enterobacteraceae. They can be quite variable um, susceptibility to fluoroquinolones. So amazingly, the liver, the pancreatic biopsies are pretty normal, but the liver had chronic inflammatory changes in there. So, so as um, speculated from the beginning, the, the pancreas might have been a secondary problem, secondary to severe liver disease, cholangitis and cholecystitis. So, so these guys, even once you get them over the initial, initial problem, there's obviously some seriously disordered problems between the, the intestines and the biliary tract and the pancreas. So they need to be, well, People probably run out of money before you can do enough um, rechecks, but these guys need to be checked regularly with ultrasounds and bloods and everything and can be a real real headache for, for vets and owners long term. So I think this is the last case. So 13-year-old female spade schnauzer vomiting six weeks ago, resolved with Clavilox, represented five days before... I saw it with vomiting, inappetence, and icterus. Um, there's been a recurrent theme in all these blood pictures showing very high bilirubins, very, very high ALPs, and pretty, very high ALTs. So, and so pretty classic post hepatic uh, picture there as a cause. So, so this dog also had some pretty, pretty impressive bile duct obstruction distension as well. Um, next time I'll show you pictures that have measurements on there, but um, it's it's um, well over four millimetres. And this dog actually had a pancreatic pseudocyst. Um, so he probably got the, the bile duct just here and then leading into this swollen pancreas and pancreatic pseudocyst. So, so um, hopefully that's been helpful and a bit of a... Um, bit of a 
kind of overview of the common diseases we see with um, diseased gallbladders and infected gallbladders with mucosils and pancreatitis. So, um, so I think um, Nick will just open up for, for questions for a minute if, if anyone's got some questions. Anyway, thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we'll make this available on our app, I think. Nick, will we? So, um, any questions? All right, well, um, thanks so much. I uh, hope everyone's staying well and um, not going too crazy under these COVID times and altered work practices. And um, and we'll send out some, we'll make this available and we'll send out some um, reminders for our next talks. Mariana is doing radiology round every Wednesday morning. What's she saying? Which is brilliant. So, um, all right, well, I'll, um, if there's no more questions. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes. Hey, Dave. Um, um, do you find that the resistance is very significant and that you have to change your therapy? Um, in um, I've, not, I've not had one that's been completely resistant to all antimicrobials and um, I maybe I'm a bit heavy-handed with, you know, using a, a penicillin and a fluoroquinolone and, uh, and, and metronidazole, but I haven't had one be resistant to all three. Some of the tricks can be got the anaerobe plus a nasty enterobacteriosi. So, so I like to hit them hard um, with the triple pronged antibiotic therapy and based on cultures wind back on your, on your therapy. So, so, so in answer to your question, no, Bron. In the milder cases that I've just put on Clavulox, I gen haven't had a major problem either. But I think in a relatively well and eating patient, in most cases, the amoxiclab has been suitable too. So I think these guys can get very septic in, well, perioperatively and have endotoxemia once they're in theatre. So that can increase the mortality rate once they go to surgery. So I like to have a lot of, well, ideally once cultures are taken, but a lot of antibiotics on board and then wind right back depending on what, what your cult sensitivity are. Does that make sense, Bron? All right. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Yes, thank you. All right, well, All right thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, bye. Bye, everyone. Yep. Goodbye, and thanks. It was really good. No worries. See you guys.